Well, welcome back to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. As we continue on at our look in the Sermon on the Mount, we're talking about we're talking about Jesus' statement that about the Law and the Prophets. Okay, that's what we did in our, our last program. Now we're continue on with that. But before we do, Mark, I'm going to ask you to pray and ask God's blessing on our time together. Oh Lord, we just thank you for the Word. We thank you for the Law. We thank you for the Prophets. And what Jesus the Christ did on the cross to put it all together. Just, Lord, give us wisdom in our hearts to see with our eyes what you've given us in the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let me just start by saying, and if you, if you missed last week's program, take the time to go look at it, because we talked about the law and the prophets, and people's, the church's attitude. When I say the church, I'm talking about that Bible believing, believing remnant of the church, spirit filled, that still seems to be missing something when it comes to the attitude towards the law and the prophets. All right, we like the prophets, the law is we're shaky about the law. So go look at that, right? And I, I talk about and what I want to talk about start now is talking about for the phrase under the law. Paul says we are not under the law, right? You know, Romans 6.14, he says, For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Now, that typically winds up bringing about something that he also deals with called licentiousness. Where you figure, okay, I'm under grace, I'm not under the law, I can do whatever I want. I have license to do what I want. And God will forgive me. Well, that's an abomination from the pits of hell. All right? And that's why it's important that we look at this and why the phrase under the law is important. Words are important. Okay, If all scripture is God-breathed, that means every word in here has power, has purpose. And this is one of the great dangers that we've talked about in some of the past programs with some of the newer translations that change words. And they change words to have different meanings. Okay. I don't care if you, you know, if, if you change a word and it has exactly the same meaning in our modern, but if you change a word and it doesn't mean the same thing, you're doing the devil's work. Yes. And there are a lot of people out there doing the devil's work with some of the modern translations, okay? In 1 Corinthians 9.20, Paul said, To the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law, though not being myself under the law. What does it mean to be under the law? No, let's, let's be clear about this. I don't want to make any mistakes. Galatians 5.18 says, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Okay? You're yeah. not under the law. And it's a burden. If you're being under well, the law. Well, I wonder how big a burden it is. You can't do it. A couple of weeks ago, you know, Alice and I, for the last few months, we've been just bouncing around. We're getting ready to bounce around over Europe. Um, bouncing around being, being led by the Spirit. Amen. <laughs> But we were moving around yeah. from place to place. We were down in Kissimmee, Florida. And right across the street from the little hotel that we were staying at, somebody had set up, they said it was a petting zoo, but they had they had a horse and carriage, and they had an elephant. They had this small elephant, and they were giving rides on the elephant. Okay? Now, you ever see pictures of people, you know, a lot of countries, people ride elephants. And I thought to myself, that's nice, that's, that's interesting. That's, you're riding on the elephant. The one thing you wouldn't want, you wouldn't want to be under the yellow. No, you would not. <laughs> yeah. Okay? Because it would squish you flat. Yes. You wouldn't be under. It's all right to be on top of the elephant. It's right to be over the elephant. Mm -hmm. But you most you don't assuredly want to don't want to be under the elephant. Being under the elephant. Now, people are taking, people are going there, taking their kids and, their, and they're paying money to ride on the elephant. Mm -hmm. So that's a good thing. That's, that's something, they're taking their kids here to quote-unquote bless them, give them a ride. If they were under the elephant, that would be a curse. Yes. Being under the elephant's a curse, being on the elephant is a blessing. And I want to tell you, the same thing is true with the Word of God. With the law, if you are under the law, that is a curse. That's the curse of the law. But if you are on the law, that's a blessing. Yes. Okay? Now... I'm going to read from Psalm 8. Now, this, this psalm has particular meaning to me. And I'm just going to read verses 4 to 6. Psalm 8, 4 to 6. 
David says, What is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the work of your hands, and you have put all things under his feet. Psalms 8, 4, 6. See, there's a good order. God is a God of good order. Satan is a, a thing of confusion, but God is a God of good order. And Mark had mentioned a verse in our last program, and I'm going to, I'm going to read the whole uh, group of uh, verses from, from Mark, Mark chapter 2. And it happened that he, this is talking about Jesus, was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to Jesus, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and he and his companions were hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate of the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priest. And he also gave it to those who were with him. Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is the Lord, even of the Sabbath. Let me try and give you an understanding. Of that. You may have a great understanding of it now, but I'm going to give it to you anyhow. Okay. The law of the Sabbath was meant to be an incredible blessing yes. to man. Yes. Because we need to refresh. We need to restore from the work of our hands. Right? Work wears you out. And so that day is your day off. Aha! Aha! And that's what the letter of the law says. We're talking about a day. Alright? Give me your Bible, please. We're talking about a day. The Sabbath is about a rest. And indeed, it was a day of rest. And that is the law. Well, that's being under the law. I'm going to change your Bible here. And I am going to go to the prophet Isaiah. Because this is about the law and the prophets. Yes? And in Isaiah 58, I want to read you what it talks about when it's talking about keeping the Sabbath. Isaiah 58, I'm going to start reading from verse 13. Isaiah 58, 13. If, because of the Sabbath, you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and honor it, desisting from your own ways, from seeking your own pleasure, and speaking your own word, then you will take the light in the Lord, he will make you ride on the heights of the earth, feed you from the heritage of Jacob. Okay, let me, now let me ask you a question. If you, and I ask you to praise the Spirit, sir. This is what you're supposed to do on the Sabbath. Okay? But what day are you supposed to desist from doing your own pleasure? Well, Jesus said you have to deny yourself. That's right. Pick up your cross and follow him. Is that on one day a week? No. No. If you desist from your own ways, are you not supposed to do that every day? Yes. Because you're supposed to be doing his way. Mm -hmm. Is that not true? From seeking your own pleasure. It's not about your pleasure. Paul said in the perilous last days, men will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. We want to please God. The ultimate, ultimate mark of success for a Christian is that on the day you come face to face with Jesus, you hear the words, well done, now good and faithful servant. Right? That you have pleased God. Right? What day are you supposed to cease and desist from speaking your own word? What day? But well, let me give you a hint. Every it's minute a, of every day. He, right. Jesus didn't speak anything on his own. He didn't. If he didn't hear from the Father, he didn't say it. And it said Peter wrote and said, "Listen, if any man speaks, let him speak as it were the oracles of God." So there's no time that you're supposed to speak from your own understanding, right? That's why you need to be slow to speak. You need to be quick to listen and slow to speak, right? Take delight in the Lord. What day are you supposed to take delight in the Lord? Every day. So what day is the Sabbath? Every day. Because the day of Sabbath, see, the Sabbath has become a burden. When you think about, I can't do this, I can't do this, I got to do that, I got to do this. What if it's just a matter of, oh, I can rest? Isn't that, isn't that a blessing? Don't you look forward to your days off? And it wasn't it supposed to be a day off? 
Well, now you can have a day off because you don't have to figure out what to do. He'll be led. He'll lead you in paths of righteousness for his sake. You don't have to speak your own words. He'll tell you what to say. All of these things. It is about resting in the Lord. What day are you supposed to rest in the Lord? Well, you know what? I'm resting in the Lord today. And I promise you, by the power of the Spirit of God, I will rest in the Lord tomorrow. And the day after. Every day has become my Sabbath, my day of rest. That's the difference between the Old Testament understanding and what I see as this, what the revealed truth of the Spirit. Jesus said that he would send the Spirit to lead us into all truth. That is the truth he has led me into. That I have, I have now the ability, the right and the power, to rest in God all the time. I, I, I worked for an elevator company a long time ago. As a direct, as a draftsman, and one of the things I think you're going to say as a driver, go ahead. I did too. Yeah. Well, at one of the things that they had one time was they got an order for an elevator for a church, and they had a switch on there that it would be a continually operating switch. It would go between two floors. It'll go from this floor open, close, go down to this floor open, go back and forth. So they can throw the switch before Sunday, and then flip the switch Monday morning, and they were not supposed to operate electrical stuff on Sunday. And when you think about it, you know, dry, dry, driving somewhere versus walking somewhere, it's easier to drive. It's more of a rest. but. Um, when you're under the law, you can't operate a car, so you have to walk three miles instead of drive, which is this more is of a Christian, hassle. Christian church? It might be Christian or Jewish, but the elevator okay, well, was the Christian church. And for, you know, they're, they're, they're really straining at gnats no, no, but you see, to that, do that. But that's the point. That's what uh, straining at gnats, swallowing camels and straining at gnats. Did I say that right? I think so. I think so. Because that is, that's not the law. That's being under the law. No, that's the curse of the law. Yes, that's that's the curse. burden of the law. Yeah. No, that's, it's, it's the, the curse. Of the, law. No, the Bible curse. calls it curse. the curse of the yeah. law. That's the curse of the law. It's when it becomes a burden. a burden, when you are enslaved to something. So rather than blessing you, it curses, it curses you. I Listen, I have a lot of dear Jewish friends. I mean, Mark has been, to, we've been to Israel together. Mm -hmm. And... That's typical of Orthodox Judaism. Yes. You know, you can't do this, you can't do that, and there's such a burden to them. It's not freeing to them. It's not a day of rest. You know, when, when rest is enforced and you can't do anything, well, it's not that, a day of rest. It's, it's not a day, day of rest. stress. Right. I was just going to say it's, they, they're stressed they're out because they're stressing you're about saying, everything. "What what can I do?" And it's it's not relaxing. And if you're in Old Jerusalem and you go to the shuk which is the marketplace where they're preparing. And you go there on Friday, and you have to go before sunset, because oh, yeah. Sabbath starts, Shabbat starts on, at sunset. You'll see these people, and it's, it's a burden for them to have to accomplish all of this in order not to, to, not, in order not to displease God. You know what pleases God? Love. Yes. You, he loves you, you love Him, and you, and you can rest in Him. I, you know, in rest and returning, it says in Isaiah 30, is your strength. You get strength from resting. That kind of that kind of Sabbath keeping is not resting. It becomes a burden. It becomes the very curse of the law that we have been set free from. Okay? So, because the law, given by God, remember it was given by God, like the words of the prophets were given by God, right? were always intended by God to bless us. Always. We've taken them and just twisted it. It was only the hard-heartedness of man and the sinfulness of man that created the curse of the law, which is what Christ redeemed us from, having become a curse for us. Galatians chapter 3. You understand that? If you do, you'll be blessed. And if you don't get that, because, listen, we're all growing in that. Talk to the Lord about it. Talk to the Lord about it. Understand that God... He desires to bless you. Now, bless you doesn't mean 
that are, you know, he's sitting there waiting to be at your beck and call and your command. Not the genie in the bottle. No, he is trying to be that loving father where you know that, that he desires to bless you. You know, how many of you are free? Most people go to work every day or, you know, five days a week, six days a week, and they are under a curse because their job is a curse to them. It's a burden to them. And they worry about keeping the job or not keeping. You know what? If you do what you're supposed to do, which is to work to the Lord, work as unto the Lord means to work for the Lord, and knowing that He will provide for all of your needs through His riches and glory in Christ Jesus, you are not dependent on that check from your workplace. You are dependent on the Lord God Almighty, to whom nothing is impossible, who owns on the camera on a thousand hills, who owns all of the rich. I mean, this is what you're dependent upon. When we don't, when we lose sight of that, life becomes a burden. Life becomes a curse. And you know what? Life is becoming a curse to so many people. Suicide is just on the increase. I, I've shared this with you before. I, I go to the VA. You know, I served in the military, and I go to I get VA, and they ask me to come in for regular checkups. When I go in for regular checkups, which we just did recently, one of the questions that they are required to ask me is, am, am I having any suicidal thoughts? Isn't that the first question that they ask you? It's one of the first questions. They, they, I'm, well, I'm not normal anymore. Because, no, I mean, most of the people at the VA that I go to know me. Yes. And they know not only who I am, but they know what I am. Yes. And it's like they ask this, and they say, well, I have to ask it because it's required of me. And they said, well, we know what your answer is going to be. Okay. I don't, I, do I... Do I have depression? The joy of the Lord fills me. There's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. You don't even want to ask me these questions half the time. If you ask me a little question, I can give you a sermon. Hallelujah. Yeah, right. But what I'm giving you is the good news yes. of Jesus Christ. I proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Words of encouragement. And I, I proclaim it at every opportunity. I mean, people, we were, we were someplace up in Jacksonville the other day, and some guy walks by and said to me in the, in the parking lot, right? He said to me, how are you doing? Are you good? And I said, no. I said, but I am righteous. Thanks to the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The guy stops in his track. And he has this look on his face like, and there's this. What did the, I open up here? No, no. He said, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what do you mean by that? Yeah. Well, hallelujah. He knows what I meant by it now. Oh, yes, he because I told him what I meant by it. Because there's opportunity all the time. Yes. Proclaim the good news. Okay. I am filled with the Word of God. He's written His Word on my tablets of my heart. Yeah. I am filled with the love of God, to overflowing, because He's poured His love into, into my heart through His Holy Spirit. I am filled with the joy of the Lord. I am filled with the peace of God. I have to, uh, over, I promise you, in this world today, I get this peace. opportunity to peace say this a thousand peace. times. People, i will be someplace and people say, you know, I'm, uh, we're doing a lot of traveling. I don't remember where the last place was. Oh, it was in a, in a Popeye's place. All right. We're waiting to get our little bucket of, or thing of fried chicken. And the, and the woman behind the counter says, I'm sorry for keeping this long. I said, that's no trouble at all. I said, patience is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. She, she looked at me. She got this great big smile on her face. And she said, you know what? I knew that. <laughs> well, is, is our religion... Is our, it, have, it, it really helps and reminds them. It does. Is our because Christianity... They get so caught up in that, this world of... Is our Christianity an in-the-building kind of thing? No. Is our Christianity something we do on Sunday and we kind of put it aside for the rest of the week? No. Or is it your life? Yes. Do you live the reality of the Word of God? Yes. This is this is being freed from the curse of the law is when you live the reality. When it's not about, oh, I have to get dressed up and go to church. Oh, I have to figure out how I'm going to talk. It's not that. This is what Christ has set you free from. Amen. That you would have that joy, the joy that He has put into you would burst forth. He came and he went have life and have it abundantly. That's what Christianity is about. Christianity is about love. It's about joy. It's about peace. It's not about the burdens of the law. It is about the blessings of the law. But it doesn't eliminate the law. It doesn't eliminate the prophets. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to get excited about Jesus Christ is the only thing I can tell you. You know, just talking about excited, just a few hours ago, a couple of hours ago, Somebody asked us, because they're talking about us traveling, we were telling them where we are going, and she said, you must be, are you excited about it? And we said, I'm excited all the time. 
But we are excited, but not about the traveling or going. It's just excited about what Jesus is doing. Absolutely. And excited about what his next step is going to be for us. Absolutely. That's what makes us excited. Not the traveling. And that's, the the abundant, yeah. that's the abundant life. Yeah. You know, Seeing what he's going to do. Before I got saved, I had stuff. Yes, oh, did. Did. goodness. I had stuff before we got saved. Mm -hmm. And now, basically, I don't have stuff. Not and it's not, a, and and this, I mean, the stuff is a burden. The stuff is a burden. You have to oh, find a goodness. warehouse for it. Yeah. You got to yeah. store it. You got to pay for it. People don't even understand. I mean, I'm sitting here, and we're in a motel room where we're staying at the moment. I'm looking at looking at our two little suitcases. Alice has a suitcase, and I have a suitcase. That's where we live. Everything, There's, basically, everything we own. That's that's clothes. That's stuff. <laughs> but see, But that, that everything we own is in those two suitcases. Everything we own is in those two suitcases. I don't have the stuff anymore. Hallelujah. You know what I have? Everything I need. Yes. Because if I have need of something, God will supply it. And he does. He never fails. Never, ever, ever. Now, I don't mind if you go out and get rich. Because if you, you know, if that's what God has planned for you. You know, it's true that God had the Apostle John pray for, for yes. Gaius. Yes. And said, I pray. Gaius had you, a you're blessed and prosper, be in health even as your soul prospers. He just passed on what God gave him. That doesn't mean he prayed that for you, by the way. No. He prayed it for Gaius because Gaius was a man who had a reputation through the entire church for his generosity, for his support of the gospel. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you something. You know, I've said this a lot of times when I teach. I teach pastors this a lot. I have a theology. Mm -hmm. God will supply. Do you not believe? Do you believe the word of God? Raise your hand if you believe the word of God. Okay. Good, I'm glad to see you do that. God will supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He says that same thing to you. Do you believe it? Yes. Don't get deceived and think that that means that when you have a need, there's going to be a knock at the door, and it's going to be UPS or FedEx. Mm -hmm. or Because, you know, it's very likely, and this is I'll, I'll use this as an example, an example I know to be true. If I have a need, God is going to supply that thing. Hallelujah. But he is likely, even more likely, to give the thing that I need to Mark. What? Because that's the way he works. See, because Mark loves me. You love me, brother? Mm -hmm. And if you see your brother in need, you give him what he needs. Because if, he, if, if I have a need of something, Mark doesn't, and God gives it to him, what does Mark now have? Oh, An abundance. Because you have more well, you than need. you need. If he gave you something that you didn't need, but I did, he, you now have an abundance. So what happens is when you see me in my need, you can give to me out of your abundance. Did you never read this in Paul's letters? That's how the body functions. If my stomach gets hungry, I don't go any place and they open up my stomach and start stuffing food in They'll give me the food. The food comes to my hand. My hand gives it to my mouth. My mouth chews it and gives it to my stomach. This, the body is the example that God made. God has a wonderful plan to bless you. And by the way, in that little scenario that I just gave, God will bless me by supplying my need. But I recall that it says hmm, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. So not only would I get blessed, but he'd get blessed. And he it says more. It's more blessed to give than So he'd get more blessed than me. And oh, what joy would bring. Learn, learn, learn to be used by God to give whatever he, God has given you an abundance of. And if Jesus said, I can, you might have life and have it abundantly. You do have an abundance of something. It may be an abundance of joy. It may be an abundance of material things. Whatever it is. You know, when I get saved, I got to tell you a story. I was a Roman Catholic. I grew up, I went to nothing but Catholic schools. I went to Catholic grammar school. I went to Catholic high school, college prep. I went to work in a Catholic seminary. They didn't beat me there. However, it's like, whatever, I, I lost my train of thought here. In, the, in those schools, what was I going to say, Alice? Quick. 
Okay. You were going to say, oh, what is it? Isn't this fun? Yeah. This is what happens. Write to me <laughs> at officeatbibletalk.com and tell me what I was about to say. Oh, well, we're talking about abundance okay. and giving. Okay, let me just get back on that track. And the, the, the point is that we have to learn that God's plan is the right plan. God will give us stuff, not for, our, not for us, because it, it's the benefit of the blessing is to give. It's more blessed to give than to receive. But we work together as a family. We work together as a body. All that God sends and does is for our blessing. If you think that the law is a curse to you, if you think the law is bad, and you think you are free from the law, you're not. The law is still there to bless you. What you are free from is being under the law and from the curse of the law. But it's all the Word of God. And I promise you, all the Word of God will build faith in your life. And that faith will lead you to an obedience to Christ. It will lead to all of the blessings of God. Read Deuteronomy 28, all right? People ask me a lot. Okay, now we're in the New Testament. What about things like tithing, for example? In the law, you can clearly see that the law required that you give 10%. Now, where you give it is not quite as clear. Other than the fact that where you give it is where he directs you. Okay? So now, now you're free from the curse of the law. So people say, Whew, I don't have to tithe anymore. Yeah, you're free to give 100%. No, now, you're commanded. you are commanded to give 100%. Jesus Christ said, none of you can be my disciple unless he gives up all his possessions. It's like the tithing that we read about in Isaiah. That it's just not one day a week, it's seven days a week. Right. It's not ten it's not ten percent. It's one hundred percent. I promise you in the next program we're gonna get into this in depth about the difference between the, the commandments of the Old Testament and, and the blessing the blessed commandments of the New Testament, all right? Because yes, you Tithing now is not giving 10%, it's giving all. The Sabbath now is not one day where you're obligated. The Sabbath is every day of your life that you're arresting the Lord. Okay? Jesus said, and this is what we're going to get into, well, you've heard it said, but I say to you. You've heard it said, but I say to you. And if you think he's contradicting himself, if he is Deuteronomy, if he is Leviticus, if he is law, and he is the prophets, you know, and he changes his mind now, well, then, then all Scripture is wrong. Because he can't change. He's not a man that he can change. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. One of the things that he said, I see you. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, I just. Well, uh, I didn't mean to cart my short, but we're, we're just, just about out of time. But I, I do want you to remember that in our next program, we're going to talk about that. Because Jesus doesn't contradict himself. What he does is open new understanding to the fullness of what he has said. He actually raises the bar. Well, <laughs> but. He raises the bar, but he gives you the Holy Spirit. So that you don't have to do anything. I mean, it's a it's, it's God now. It's, before it's in the Old Testament, without the Holy Spirit, you're doing the work. Right. Now it is God working through you. It is God working in you and through you. So it relieves you of the burden. To be the willing okay. vessel. To be the willing vessel. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for the work that you have done in our lives, for the work that you are doing in our lives, for the work that you are yet to do in our lives. Lord, may it all be for the glory of your name. God bless you and goodbye. Until next time.